I wasn't prepared for this being full screen, so I'm going to be standing next to it, hopefully. Um, so I run a company called Tinkerit. This is us yesterday. This is yesterday in the office. Today is a deadline day. I'm not there, and I'm quite happy not to be there, to be honest. Um, we're a strange little company. We build interactive products, spaces, and events. Um, that will all sort of tr hopefully make sense by the end of this talk. Um, one of the people I started the company with is a man called Massimo Banzi. Massimo, on top of being an electronics engineer, is also the co-founder of a platform called Arduino. Who here has heard of Arduino? Okay, I'm sort of preaching to the converted. Perfect. Um, it's, you know, open source platform, very, very cheap. It was also um, designed by this group of people, mostly academics. So it is an academic sort of born project. And it was born out of the desire to have an open source platform that was cheap enough for designers and hobbyists and anyone really creative to get involved with electronics. Sort of a simple concept, but it's come a long way. This, was, this project was born in 2005. We're now in 2009. They've uh, sold about 70,000 units around the world, probably at this point. And uh, this is sold all around the world and is really um, sort of the cornerstone for a lot of ways in which creative people understand technologies and play with technologies. Bablino has an Arduino inside of it, for example. So this is uh, the platform. If you've never seen it, it's about the size of a credit card. And uh, it's basically a piece of hardware that allows you via USB to connect to your computer, program the chip with software that's freely available, and uh, then get it to do a bunch of different things. If you're interested particularly in what Arduino does, one nice thing to Google for while you're listening to me uh, is the top 40 best Arduino projects on the internet. And there's a list of those things. And uh, you'll get anything from um, uh, sort of controlling medical devices to controlling cars to uh, tracking your cat, all those types of things. Uh, these are the things that are emerging out of a technology platform being open source, being cheap, and being accessible and understandable to the masses. So when Herb asked me to come and talk at TEDx, which I was extremely honored about, uh, the theme was creativity. And in my little world, strange little world, creativity takes different forms. Um, so these are all the different Arduinos. Um, and the way in which we think about creativity has a lot to do with how we think about how technologies work, how open they are, and what we can do with them. But that's us, and that's you know a specific group of people who are probably uh, described more often than, than not as geeks. Most people are quite comfortable using products, and if they're a bit rubbish, sort of either modifying their use of them to adapt to them or chucking it in the bin. There's not necessarily that curiosity to do more with them. We tend to do more. A lot of people don't. This is annoying. OK. Um, and I think most of us are quite comfortable in the knowledge that something just works. So this is off of Flickr, a beautiful picture uh, that I've covered with everything that had to do with anything that was closed technologies that we carry in our bags. That can be our iPod, that can be our laptop, that can be our camera. These are things that we carry around with us without thinking too much about it. We're quite happy that they work and we don't really know or care to know what's inside of them. And that's um, a particular, or what I'm going to try to explore is whether this is something that's going to change or not. Are we going to be constantly satisfied with a sort of status quo in terms of knowledge? Because really what we're talking about is the difference between a technophile and a technophobe. Um, and the difference between open access to technology being a great thing, being something you embrace, being something that you really um, you know, enjoy and really crave, versus, well, you know, this used to work and uh, this works right now, I'm kind of happy with it, but also you know, the thing that I had 20 years ago was quite nice. 
Uh, I'm young, but I'm not, you know, I'm old enough to have used rotary phones, to have used answering machines, and all those things. Five, someone five years younger than me might never have seen those things. Um, and that's a huge, there's a huge amount of nostalgia that I might have towards tapes that that person can never understand. Uh, and in a world that's embedded with technologies that we don't understand, uh, the generation that I represent and anybody older than me has experienced technologies in completely different ways. You're used to taking a pencil and rewinding a tape when it got, you know, taken, taken off. Um, you're used to doing that kind of thing. You're used to opening a car and being able to see what's inside of it, whereas now the, you know, you're more likely to see a USB slot for someone to check what's wrong with it. The accessibility to technology was quite tangible, whereas now we're kind of happy with the black boxes. Um, but there's difference between the black boxes because of course you could argue that, yeah, but this is a black box too. Arduino, these platforms, it kind of looks weird, it kind of looks you know, too technological, um, but in a way, that's just a matter of language and that's just a matter of vocabulary. If you spent enough time looking at it and if you spent enough time having to look at it, it's sort of like learning how to program or learning HTML or learning CSS. If you stare at it long enough, you understand what it's made of and you would only do that if it allowed you to do something. So if I look at this, I can sort of see, you know, the Bluetooth module here, I see pins in and out, and that's just because I've been staring at this for about two years. Um, whereas if I look at this, which is the inside of a phone, um, I can sort of guess some of the things, but they've hidden a lot of it away from me. And they do that because they need to. In their, you know, their perceived way of thinking about the products that they have is that they need to. Uh, I would argue that I could build a phone entirely based on this that would have the same amount of functionality, but I, at least I knew how to fix it and certainly how it worked. And that knowledge barrier wouldn't exist. Again, maybe that's just me. And it sort of says a lot about how we learn to live with these chips and with these uh, little elements that you know we couldn't possibly understand how to program. I mean, I work with some fantastic people. Peter Knight, who's on our team, uh, knows how to code a chip from scratch in assembly language or machine code, as it's also known, which I, I don't want to know, really. This is why I have him around. Um, but what that chip would allow me to do, this could possibly facilitate that process. And in a way, this is giving me all I need to know to actually have control and have knowledge. Again, a particular community. What I would argue is that I'm probably at the, or the business that we've created is probably at the beginning of a whole generation of people who are just inherently curious. They want to know how things work. They want to know uh, what they can get their hands on. Uh, they will grow up with platforms like Arduino being part of their school's curriculum. And how will that make them? There's a, um, one of my favorite uh, authors is Alessandro Barico, who's an Italian author. And he has just written a book called The Barbarians. And it's all about children who are now growing up in uh, a community and in a way of working where they're completely connected when they're online, they've got every account you could possibly imagine, they've got their iPod, they've got their friends, their two cell phones, etc. And then they go to school and there's one person telling them how it is in a room with 20 other people. That's a completely schizophrenic way of learning that either we will move away from and education will evolve itself into a model that's much more flexible or we'll have a generation that is sort of socially and knowledge wise completely schizophrenic, has these two approaches, constantly juggles between these two modes of thinking. And I think if anything, if the Arduino becomes successful and if this particular platform starts to infiltrate academia, starts to infiltrate industry, if people start innovating with this platform, which they already are, 
um, what will happen to our habits around technologies? Will our habits change? Will, whenever we have a particular product in front of us, we'll immediately go and check the data sheet? Will that become a thing that people will do, that young people will do? People who are not my age, people who are 15, 12, 13, who are learning to program now, who are learning about Arduino now, and will grow up and will grow in businesses, will go work at Microsoft, will go work at Google, and all those companies, and influence how they think about product design, what their expectations of technologies are, and change things radically, because the black box will no longer be acceptable. And we're sort of building new expectations in terms of how we understand creativity and what we expect a creative person to look like. Will a creative person just come out of fine arts, graphic design, product design? No, not necessarily. They will be a mixture of a whole bunch of things. There will be someone who knows how to program, who has come and, and did printmaking and has built installations. That will be the new creativity, this sort of mix. When people will tell you or will ask you, what do you do? You will be incapable of answering because there is no one liner. There is no, I do this, you know, or I am an artist. Um, that's not going to be acceptable anymore because people will be curious. They'll go, oh yeah, that's kind of cool. What do you do? What kind of programming language do you use? Oh, you've used this. Well, pick is kind of better. And, You'll have those conversations with people and people will know what you're talking about as opposed to most people or most situations I find myself in where I have to sort of, you know, um, look at people and avoid the blank stare and go, well, you know, I play with technology and that's pretty much all you need to know and that's fine. Uh, I think in, you know, five years, people will be comfortable with these notions. Um, I'm just going to share a video, five minutes, good. Um, I'm just going to share a video with you of something that we worked on recently. I'm only going to share two pieces of work that we've worked on, um, but this I quite like, which is called the Centograph. This was done for St. Paul School for Boys, which is a, quite a posh school in Hammersmith uh, around London. And um, we built something that essentially would allow them to, whoa, it's all right. It's all right would allow them to communicate the value of their technology programs. They have about four technology programs for young boys aged 7 to 11, I think. And uh, they basically wanted a way to publicly explain, so, okay, what's these what are these technology programs good for? Because the parents don't understand it, um, the patrons of the school don't understand it, and certainly the other departments don't understand it. So this is something that we built. Credits roll. Um, and so the idea being that you could look for any keyword on the internet, anything at all, anything that came to mind, and the uh, each bar represented 10 years and it showed a century of use of that word. It looked for uh, the occurrence of that word on Google News Archives and then just gave a value that would raise these bars up and down. And what happened was pretty quickly, firstly everybody got involved. So um, very, very young kids of about three-year-old would look for the word dog or cat. Um, and then people would then look for, um, is that, do you want, can I get my presentation? Sorry, oh, yes. Yeah. No, sorry. sorry. I'm going to skip over the second video. I don't think I have time. Um, people would look for words that would create the biggest curve. So they would look for um, things like Hitler 
or Second World War or uh, Bush, Facebook, etc. Okay, cool. Thanks. Um, and l this was a way of interacting with online content that was physical, uh, that completely changed their relationship to the activity of Googling for something. You know, you Google for something, you kind of go, okay, well, the first 10 results are good, whatever, I'm getting what I want. This was an exercise in being able to physically understand in a very sort of slow way. It took forever to lift the bars. Uh, but people would get engaged and people would go, oh, I wonder, you know, I wonder what could create the nicest looking result or the most peak at the end of the century or the beginning of the century. Um, this is another piece of work that we did uh, just, we finished this just last week. This was part of the Guardian Hack Day. The Guardian invites developers and um, sort of weird people like us to come in and do stuff for them. And this was called, whew, I thought I had an image in there. This was called the Twat Race. Um, because uh, the, uh, David Cameron said that too many tweets make a twat, um, then the idea was to track all the retweeting from all the different political parties and show that and show how many twats there were, actually, if everybody was reading Twitter. I'm sure this is the first time on a TED video that someone says twat, but never mind. Um, so you had little motors that would lift up these very, very thin wires and lift the logo up dynamically as it was happening. Very simple. It took us a day to build. This was a 24-hour hack day, but got the point across, got people laughing, and uh, got them realizing how active you know, who was more active? Who in their political choices was more active on Twitter? And you could draw whatever conclusions you wanted from that. Um, so I'm going to uh, wrap up by saying, uh, basically, I think our world is changing. The way we relate to technology is changing. The, world, the way that we relate to creativity is changing. It's going to become much more granular. It's going to become much more uh, open. The BBC had an article recently saying that uh, we should become a nation of programmers. Um, you know, what does that mean? That means that everybody can then pick up anything that they happen to want to get, to get their hands around on the internet uh, or otherwise and then do something with it. There's some fantastic people in the room that I recognize who are involved locally around Liverpool in the north in sort of bringing that together and also bringing this physical aspect together, the physical technologies that we have, all these little black boxes that shouldn't exist. Um, and what we, what we will consider creative will evolve. So I'm reading this fantastic book at the moment, and I will leave you with this thought. It's sort of, if you build it, they will come. If you imagine it right now, it might just become possible. And certainly what we're trying to do is make that possible. Thank you very much.